Greetings and welcome to Cognix's fourth quarter 2020 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. I would now like to turn this conference over to your host, Ms. Susan Conway, Senior Director of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. With us are Cognex's Chairman, Dr. Bob Shillman, President and CEO, Rob Willett, and Chief Financial Officer, Paul Todger. I'd like to point out that our earnings release and annual report on Form 10-K are available on our Investor Relations website at www.cognex.com forward slash investor. Both contain highly detailed information about our financial results. During the call, you may use, we may use a non-GAAP financial measure if we believe it is useful to investors, or if we believe it will help investors better understand our results or business trends. You can see a reconciliation of certain items from GAAP to non-GAAP in Exhibit 2 of the earnings release. Any forward-looking statements we made in the earnings release or any that we may make during this call are based upon information that we believe to be true as of today. Things often change, however, and actual results may differ materially from those projected or anticipated. You should refer to our SEC filing, including our most recent Form 10-K, for a detailed list of risk factors. Now, I'd like to turn the call over to Dr. Bob. Thanks, Sue, and hello, everyone. Welcome to our fourth quarter earnings conference call. As shown in the news release issued earlier today, Cognex reported record fourth quarter revenue for 2020, and we also set a record for annual revenue as well. It was a challenging year, but with a lot of hard work, we did quite well and emerged in very good shape for 2021. This year marks a very important anniversary for Cognex. We've not only been in existence for 40 years, but we continue to be the leader in our field. This is a significant milestone that few technology companies achieve. You know, machine vision was in its infancy in 1981, but it is now playing a critical role in both industrial automation and in logistics, where it ensures the quality and accurate delivery of virtually everything that you purchase. And by continuing to invest wisely in technology, we intend to continue to be the world's leading provider of machine vision and advanced barcode systems. Finally, as we also announced earlier today, this will be my last conference call as chairman of Cognex. After 40 years at the helm, I've decided to retire from Cognex's board of directors and also as an executive officer of the company. I will continue to be a cognoid as an advisor to the company. Of course, I have mixed emotions about this transition, but I'm at that point in my life uh, to make it, and it also happens to be a time of unusual strength at Cognex. I'm very confident in Rob's leadership and in the team's understanding of our business, our customers, and our culture, and it gives me great comfort knowing that I'm leaving the helm of this very special company in very capable hands. Now I'll turn the call over to my partner and Cognex's super capable CEO, Rob Willett. Rob, the microphone is yours. Wow, thank you, Dr. Bob. Thank you and, and good evening, everyone. Before we discuss our financial results, I want to take a minute and thank Dr. Bob for his immense contributions to Cognex and for instilling the enthusiastic, entrepreneurial spirit that is the hallmark of our company. Dr. Bob and the unique culture he built over the past four decades will forever be a part of Cognex. Now for our financial results. 2020 was a roller coaster ride, both for the world and certainly for us at Cognex. We entered 2020 optimistic about growth. 2019 had been a challenging year in which lower spending by customers in our two largest markets, automotive 
and consumer electronics resulted in our first revenue decline in nine years. However, after the global COVID-19 outbreak in March 2020 and the related supply disruptions, business shutdowns, and capital investment pullback, we recognized that the outlook for 2020 had changed. We no longer believed 2020 would bring the broad-based strength we had expected when we started the year. Given the circumstances, we quickly took steps to adjust our operating expenses to align with more modest growth. These steps included a workforce reduction, which was difficult for us, and an organizational realignment that better focused our internal investments on high growth opportunities and important operational priorities. As a result of these changes, we've been better able to support Cognoids and customers through our own difficult pandemic-related challenges. From a business perspective, the second half of 2020 was much more positive than initially expected. You can think of it as a tale of two halves. Revenue in the second half of the year was up a surprising 41% over the first half. As a result, we reported good financial results for 2020, setting a 40-year record for annual revenue. Revenue grew by 12% year-on-year, thanks largely to higher spending by customers in consumer electronics and logistics, where we benefited from strong partnerships with market and technology leaders that fared well during the pandemic. Spending in the broader factory automation market has also improved from depressed levels in Q2. In consumer electronics, revenue increased by approximately 30% year-on-year. It also represented roughly 30% of total revenue and became our largest market. Much of our revenue in consumer electronics relates to the assembly of smartphones and the production of related components. In 2020, there was also a larger relative contribution from other electronic devices necessary for online learning and the work from home dynamic. Logistics revenue grew by approximately 40% over 2019 due to growth in the e-commerce sector. Now representing approximately 20% of total revenue, logistics surpassed automotive to become our second largest market. We benefited from major e-commerce and omni-channel retailers investing in automation to enable higher throughput and cost reductions. Other sectors of logistics, such as bricks and mortar retail and airport baggage handling, struggled in 2020. Further bright spots included medical-related industries and semi, both of which grew double digits year on year. We're proud that manufacturers serving the healthcare industry are relying on Cognex to help make COVID vaccines available to the public. More specifically, Cognex machine vision and deep learning are an integral component of production machines worldwide to ensure the highest quality standards and full traceability in COVID vaccines. Applications include inspecting vials for defects, ensuring vials of vaccines are filled to the correct level and are free of contaminants, and ensuring that vaccine kits are packaged correctly. That's most of the good news. On the negative side, automotive revenue declined by approximately 20% year-on-year as business shutdowns further worsened already weak fundamentals. As a result, the automotive market, which was our largest market in 2019, dropped to third place in 2020. Automotive is improving somewhat from its most depressed levels in Q2 and increased Q4 year on year for the first time in several quarters. However, it remains at a significantly lower level than in recent years. Let's talk now about Cognoids, our people. Our achievements in 2020 were the result of the dedication of Cognoids around the world. They exemplified our strong culture by working hard and moving fast in a volatile environment to meet significantly increased demands from a few of our existing customers to win new customers and to successfully manage our supply chain. Because of their efforts, we launched powerful new products 
that have made our superior vision tools easier to use and therefore available to a wider audience. The most important introduction in 2020 and one of our most successful product launches ever was the Insight D900 smart camera. Leveraging Insight's widely recognized Easy Builder interface, the D900 enables both existing Cognex customers and new users of machine vision to apply our VIDI deep learning tools to inspect surfaces for defects. Popular applications include the detection of scratches and chipped surfaces that were previously too difficult to solve using traditional rule-based vision. We also integrated deep learning technology that we acquired with Suolab. These techniques are now sold together with our VIDI tools running on the Cognex Vision Pro deep learning software platform and are being widely adopted by more sophisticated customers to solve their most complex vision problems. Revenue from applications utilizing our deep learning technology more than doubled year on year in 2020. As we look at the opportunities ahead, we believe we are just scratching the surface, no pun intended, of what we can accomplish. We believe deep learning and logistics will be major contributors to growth in the years ahead. Now let's talk about 3D. Last month, we launched the Insight 3D L4000, an exciting new smart camera platform for the fast-growing industrial 3D vision market. The 3D L4000 leverages our successful Insight Intuitive Spreadsheet Interface, making it easy for our broad Insight customer base to use powerful new vision tools created for true 3D inspection. Under development for some time, the 3D L4000 packs novel capabilities into a compact form factor without the need for a separate PC. Exciting features include patented optics technology for superior image quality and the broadest range of 3D vision tools available in a vision system. We believe the 3D L4000 is a breakthrough product that makes 3D as easy to use as 2D vision. It positions us very effectively against competitors who have significant sales and profits in this area. Both Cognoids and customers are excited about these new products and others we have in our pipeline. Now I will turn the call over to Paul for details of the fourth quarter. Thank you, Rob, and hello, everyone. I'm pleased to report record fourth quarter revenue, Cognex's first Q4 greater than $200 million. At $224 million, fourth quarter revenue grew 32% year on year. It was also above the guidance we gave you last quarter. The biggest contributor to growth was the e-commerce sector of logistics, which was stronger than we expected. In the broader factory automation market, the positive momentum we experienced in Q3 held up better than anticipated and was the biggest driver of our beat to guidance. Consumer electronics grew nicely year on year and was down on a sequential basis, as we expected. Gross margin was 75% compared to 74% in Q4 of 2019. The stronger performance was due to a favorable product mix and higher volume. Gross margin in logistics, while still dilutive to the company overall, continues to improve. The restructuring program we announced last spring has been completed. Final charges totaling $875,000 were recorded in Q4. Excluding those charges, the combined total of RD&E and SG&A costs increased by 15% sequentially and was roughly flat year on year. The increase sequentially was more than we expected due to higher incentive compensation related to our performance in 2020. I'm encouraged that Cognoids earned strong sales commissions and bonuses in 2020. I can tell you they've earned it. As a result, we fully funded, or sorry, as a reminder, we fully funded our company bonus pool in 2020 after not paying a bonus in 2019. We continue to realize savings in travel and entertainment and from the restructuring actions. Operating margin was 26% in Q4, which was below the exceptional level we reported in the prior quarter, but 1,600 basis points higher than Q4 of 2019. 
Turning now to everybody's favorite subject, taxes. There were substantial discrete tax items recorded in all periods that make comparisons difficult. In Q4 of 2020, discrete items combined for a net benefit of $14 million. The largest was savings we realized on our U.S. tax liability when we filed our federal tax return in October related to new IRS regulations on the treatment of foreign taxes paid on acquired Suolab technology. Excluding all discrete tax items, the effective tax rate was 14% in Q4 of 2020, 18% in Q3 of 2020, and 18% in Q4 of 2019. The slight decrease compared to our guidance in the prior periods was because we earned a greater share of profit overseas. Reported earnings were $0.39 cents per share in Q4, compared with $0.46 cents in Q4 of 2019 and $0.49 cents in Q4 of 2020. Sorry, Q3 of 2020. On a non-GAAP basis, earnings were $0.32 cents per share in Q4, compared with $0.11 cents in Q4 of 2019 and $0.47 cents in Q3 of 2020, excluding discrete tax items and restructuring and other charges. Looking at the change in revenue for Q4 from a geographic perspective, we saw broad-based growth across all regions year on year. The Americas reported strong growth, increasing by about one-third due to growth in logistics and incremental revenue from medical-related industries, including companies scaling up production for COVID-related products. In Europe, revenue also grew by one-third over Q4-19. Logistics, consumer electronics, and the broader factory automation market increased, despite many businesses operating under significant restrictions. Foreign exchange contributed about 600 basis points to that growth. Revenue from Asia increased by more than 25% year-on-year due to growth from consumer electronics, logistics, and the broader market. Turning to the balance sheet, we ended 2020 with $767 million in cash and investments and no debt. This balance is below both the end of 2019 and the end of Q3 due to a $2 per share special dividend paid in Q4, or as Dr. Bob likes to say, a very special dividend. Our approach to capital allocation remains unchanged. We continue to manage Cognex for the long term while sharing success with shareholders. Given how well we are weathering the current serious economic conditions and the fact that we have no debt, our board decided it was in the best interest of shareholders to return excess cash ahead of potentially higher tax rates. Now, I'll turn the call back over to Rob. Thank you, Paul. In summary, Cognex ended 2020 on a strong note, and our guidance for Q1 is also very positive. Even so, the business environment continues to be difficult and volatile. In addition, the strength we experienced in the second half was less broad-based than we'd like. We believe revenue for Q1 will be between $225 million and $245 million, which represents growth of more than 40% year-on-year at the midpoint. We expect Q1 will be the third quarter in a row in which revenue will grow by more than 30% as a result of substantial backlog of logistics orders that we intend to convert to revenue in the first half predominantly in Q1. Gross margin is expected to be in the mid-70% range and likely lower than the gross margin we reported in Q4, given the expected higher mix of revenue from logistics. Operating expenses are expected to be flat to slightly down year on year. We expect savings due to our restructuring actions and lower travel and entertainment costs offset by higher commissions from the strong revenue growth we are projecting for the quarter. Lastly, the effective tax rate is expected to be 18%, excluding discrete tax items. Now, we will open the call for questions. Operator, please go ahead. At this time, we will be conducting a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad a confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you would like to remove your question from the queue. 
for participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary for you to pick up your handset before pressing the star key. Please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up prior to getting back in the queue. One moment while we pull for questions. Our first question comes from the line of Jim Rashuti with Needham and Company. You may proceed with your question. Hi, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. And Dr. Bob, I wish you the best. Thank you, Jim. Um, so on to uh, the outlook. It sounds like the, um, the mix of business that you're suggesting in Q1, fair to say, Rob, is that skewed a little bit more toward the logistics than you would normally see because of the, the order activity and what you have in backlog going into the quarter? Yes, hi, hi Jim. Um, yes, it is. Yeah, I think, I think we're, you know, we're seeing growth across most of the industries we serve in the first quarter, but the majority of the growth we're going to see in Q1 is going to be a result of logistics and orders that we already have in the backlog. And just with respect to logistics, it, it appears you, you now have uh, another large customer officially that you're disclosing in, in your K, although you're not identifying that customer, but um, I believe it's 14 percent of revenues. Can you give us a sense just as you think about the outlook for the logistics business, broadly speaking, in 21 and perhaps with this customer? your your visibility, your line of sight into that, that business? Yes, well, you, you know, you correctly point out that we do have another, you know, large over 10% customer now um, at Cognex for the, for the first time having a second one. Um, and, uh, and it is a customer in logistics. Uh, and um, you asked about, um, you know, kind of visibility on the logistics business. You know, we're seeing, you know, a lot of strong growth in that market. You can see we reported about 40% growth in revenue last year and uh, very substantial growth on deck here in the first quarter. I think we, we think the first quarter will probably be our highest logistics revenue quarter in a while, right? It is obviously larger than, um, than we think we will be, you know, reporting in the subsequent quarters. Um, but, um, we, um, you know, we see we see broad-based strength across that whole area, and a number of other, you know, good good customers coming online that will be um, reporting revenue on, and a lot of growth as we move through the year. Um, in terms of visibility, there's some short cycle business in logistics, um, you know, that turns more quickly from bookings into revenue, and then so probably less than half of it is that, and then there are some larger deployments that we do, um, which tend to be on our, our books, um, you know, booked and then turning into revenue sometimes two, three quarters after it books um, uh, and shows up in our backlog. So that's the kind of dynamics that we're looking at. Thank you. I'll jump back in the queue. Our next question comes from the line of Josh Pokowinski with Morgan Stanley. You may proceed with your question. Hi, good evening, folks, and uh, Dr. Bob, congrats uh, again on a, a successful and stored career. Thank you, Josh. So as, as long as we're kind of 10K diving here, um, I guess maybe first question, you know, I noticed, I think for the first time, I, I haven't scanned every single line, but um, Rob, the, you mentioned China competition kind of up front as, you know, a new, a new risk in, uh, in the business description. Um, I didn't see that last year. Anything that we should be aware of? I mean, China still seems like it's growing pretty well, but is there a market shift going on there that kind of bears pointing out? Because um, certainly last year wouldn't indicate it, but it's, it's new language all the same. Yeah, hi, Josh. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't think there's anything too dramatic or radical going on there. You know, I think, um, I think over a number of years we've seen our competitors in, in China um, switch from being our sort of global competitors and seeing more, more and more aggressive local competitors uh, going on, uh, you know, c coming into the market. So um, I, I think we're seeing that, you know, and I think, um, you know, we're, uh, we're keenly aware of that and we monitor the situation very carefully. And, uh, you know, some of them try to compete on price, which can be difficult in machine vision where there's a lot of technical expertise required, but certainly they're getting better. So, Yes, you know, we, we take them more and more seriously and we watch them closely. And, and I would consider them, you know, a risk to the future 
to the future of the business. Got it. It's helpful. And then, yeah, I noticed a lot of the, the one Q commentary focusing on logistics, and I, I guess rightfully so. It's consistent with what we hear from some of your, the other peers in that space. But, you know, the other two big markets that, that weren't really touched on, uh, electronics and auto, um, electronics, you know, we know that inventories are still low, lead times are still long. Auto, I think some of the broader automation, you know, cohort has seen a lot of strength in China in particular. How are those factoring into the one Q guide or, or how is your visibility for, for those markets? Um, just given that you haven't really touched on it as much. So I think we, we expect to see, um, you know, all, all, you know, most or all of our markets grow Q1 year on year, but the big growth we see coming from logistics and, um, I think, uh, you know, consumer electronics, we saw, you know, a big year last year. Um, we, we still would expect to see some growth um, in, in Q1 um, in that market. But generally, Q1 is a low quarter for logistics. I'm sorry, for consumer electronics. It's not a big um, – tends to be more Q2 and Q3 tend to be our big consumer electronics um, uh, quarters. You know, I, I often get asked this time of year, like, how is the year looking for consumer electronics? And I – give it the same answer, really, um, uh, that I give every year, which is we really don't have visibility we can share with you until sort of the May conference call. So I think we'll get a better sense of that overall. I think if we look back at consumer electronics last year, we saw it near the back end of the year. We didn't see much revenue from consumer electronics in Q2, and we saw most of it in, in Q3 and still some healthy you know revenue in Q4. And you know, I think that was due to the, the difficulty in standing up lines and, um, you know, uh, get, getting uh, component inventory coming out of the most serious COVID uh, conditions in China and elsewhere in the, in the spring. So that was the kind of the dynamic there. Um, you know, I think we're going to see, you know, more, more aggressive and, and uh, faster deployment schedule probably as we come into this year, but that's still um, relatively uh, un, un, unknown. Um, anyway, and then I think, you know, we were expecting a lot of, you know, 5G uh, uh, and uh, a lot of other technology coming into phones last year. I would think it's fair to, fair to say some of which, you know, we didn't see happen and we hope and expect will now come into this year's build um, and, uh, you know, which should help the electronics market. But also, you know, electronics can be a bit of a up and a down market, up one year up, the next year down, the next one up, and certainly last year was more of an up market. So. You know, we have uh, moderate expectations. You asked about um, automotive as well. And, uh, you know, I did say that, you know, the fourth quarter that we just reported was the first in a number of quarters that we saw year-on-year -year growth in, uh, in automotive. And, uh, you know, we're, we're certainly seeing that um, pretty broadly um, across all markets, in, including China. Got it. That's very helpful. Thanks, Rob. I'll get uh, back in queue, and congrats to your team. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Richard Eastman with Robert W. Baird & Co. You may proceed with your question. Uh, yes. Um, yes. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Dr. Bob, best of luck. Wow, it won't be the same. You'll have to, uh, Thank you, Richard. Thank you. you will have to stay visible. I've just uh, been so impressed with uh, – just what you've done with Cognex, and um, it's just been uh, a fabulous uh, public company story. So uh, best of luck. Thank you. And uh, much of that gain is uh, due to uh, the tremendous uh, uh, strategic and operational capabilities of, uh, of my partner, Rob, and, uh, uh, and the team that he's built. But uh, I'll take part credit at any rate, so thank you. <laughs> you are very welcome. Hey, Rob, just to... Could you just speak to, um, you know, there's so much press here lately and, uh, you know, the challenges seem to be uh, increasing, not decreasing around just semi-chip shortages, uh, both from, uh, I'm curious, the impact that you might see from that, um, both on your own business um, and your own supply chain, but also just on how the customers are going to approach, you know, this, this increasing uh, shortage scenario that we're seeing kind of globally. Just your thoughts around that for 21? Yeah, hi, Rick. Um, well, first of all, for Cognex, um, you know, we, we um, 
we're pretty uh, capable at, in terms of having um, plenty of component inventory at Cognex. You know, we're, we're not we're not afraid of having um, very significant inventory and, and, and of key components and chips really um, a part of that. So, we, you know, we're feeling uh, comfortable at the moment about our ability to go on supplying on time for you know for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, so but so so we're we're feeling in. Uh, in, in good shape in that respect. Um, you know, later in the year, if we found there was massive decommitment on already ordered and accepted orders from from uh, from our uh, our own suppliers, that might lead to trouble. But I'm not. We're not concerned at the moment. But then, obviously, the other impact is more on our customers and specifically automotive. And I'd say that's a bit of a, a you know a bit of a area of confusion at the moment. We're seeing, you know, stronger demand in automotive than perhaps we'd expected. And so part of me wonders, or part of the team wonders to what degree that that's um, kind of panic buying or forward buying from customers who really don't need to be doing that from Cognex, or to what degree it's really, um, you know, a, an, an uptick in the market overall. But certainly, uh, you know, can, you can read about it in the press that automotive particularly are, um, you know, there, there are plants from very large, um, you know, OEMs that are that are closed because they can't get components mm-hmm. to, uh, mm-hmm. to go, and in, in America too. So we're certainly seeing that as well in terms of our sort of basic interaction with with automotive. Automotive is where we're seeing it mostly. Um, you know, I'm not seeing much of that um, affecting our electronics business, and then our semi business itself. You know, is 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 putting up good numbers right now. We've seen good good growth in semi last year and that appears to be continuing um, currently okay and just to, to dovetail on to the automotive question you know just just numerous and really aggressive uh, schedules to bring EVs to market you know somewhere in the 23 to 20 you know 23 to 25 maybe uh, time frame and you know, again, we're seeing a little bit of uptick here. It's probably, you know, off of a pretty trough kind of balance around, probably more around ICE uh, vehicles. But my question really is, when do you expect to maybe see some line of sight and start to get some traction, you know, that's really focused on, you know, the EV market, in ter- you know, and including kind of battery capacity? Um, is that, you know, is that kind of, push to 2223 uh for you or how, how do you think about the timing there yeah well rick I, I first of all i think about you know battery manufacture and that that's a business that we see a lot of demand provision now and, and we're yeah. very well positioned with um, you know particularly with deep learning but really the whole range of our products um and uh, it's a market we've worked on for a while and that we see and we do business really with all of the major um players in that space, and we're definitely seeing, you know, very strong and, and inc- improving demand in that in that market. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's it's um, material yet to our business, but I think it can be, um, you know, in, in a relative in the in the medium term, in a relatively uh, short period of time. Um, so we see that. Then we see, like you, Bo, well, probably not like you. We see we see um, visibility <laughs> with our with our major customers on their plans to bring to market. You know, electric vehicles, and uh, and and certainly there. You know, generally, if if, um, if if a major brand owner, you know, OEM is has is planning to launch a major electric vehicle, they're really bringing in vision in about 18 months in advance, right? So you know, that okay. and they're introducing us to the line builder, and uh, they're specking the vision um, to to scale that up, right? You know, and certainly we're seeing you know some of some of the signs of that beginning. We. We, of course, have seen it over the last couple of years as well, but in a relatively small way, and we're starting to see that in a larger way. So that's kind of the positive side of it. And interestingly enough, you know, electric vehicles, you know, they have a lot of different things going on. Obviously, they don't have the um, the, uh, the powertrain um, in, the, in what we used to see with the internal combustion engine cars, but certainly there's a lot more sensors. Right, and there's you know a lot of changes changes to the product, you know, just whether it's even things like wheels, you know, and, and tires and, uh, and and other things that uh, that we're seeing opportunities around as a, re- as a result of that switch. And then on you know on the other side, I think you know investment in um, internal combustion engine vehicles obviously is being minimized, which is headwind in that market too. Understood. Yep. Yep. And just to just sneak in one last question: Did did 3D vision? 
as you define it, um, you know, consistently, is has it grown to, you know, more than 5% of sales with all the puts and takes in, in the other markets? Is it, you know, is it 10% of sales yet? Or? It's, uh, it's less than 10%, and it okay. did grow. It did grow pretty healthily last year. I think we have much higher expectations of it in the next few years, given the product launches we've announced recently. Gotcha. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes to the line of Joe Giordano with Cowan and Company. You may proceed with your question. Hey guys, uh, Dr. Dr. Bob, uh, I was born the same year you founded Cognex, and sadly for me, I've accomplished a lot less in the in the last, last 40 years than you guys have. So congratulations, and um, you'll be missed. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much, and I hope your next 40 is more productive than your first 40. Then. <laughs> me too. Uh, Rob, you know, you've always categorized logistics potential as, you know, on average 50% a year. Now that you've, you know, have a big customer there that's very material, you, you know, it's a much larger business, you grew 40% this year. Is that still your normalized expectation? And within that context, is that doable unless that, is it doable with, with, without the large customer growing at at least that pace? Well, first, first of all, Joe, uh, you know, Cognex, we're very ambitious and we have stretch goals. So I've described the 50% as a stretch goal number, but one we've been able to achieve or come close to, you know, for, for a number of years here with logistics. We grew about 40% last year, and I think we would have hit that or exceeded that 50% number have some of the other logistics markets, but we expected very strong growth from coming into the year, notably more bricks and mortar retailers and airport baggage handling to have put up the numbers we were hoping to. So, so certainly that's the case. Um, and then we do see a lot of you know uh, diversification of our customers um, in general. We have many more um, uh, omni-channel retailers who are investing in a, in a big way um, to to have an e-commerce platform that, that complements their stores. So you know we we expect to see other large, obviously n maybe not. 10% customers, but large customers as we move through the years ahead. And then, you know, our, our big customer there, you know, obviously is, um, you know, a major investor in automation and one, I think, that still has a very small share of the overall market that it can address. So, and, uh, you know, and global aspirations that I think we're hoping to and expecting to keep up with. So it's certainly, the, the potential is clearly there and the technology and uh, the infrastructure we've put in place to serve it is there. Yes, and uh, but you know there may be there may be volatility along the way, particularly within quarters, um, in that business. Understood. Um, and then Paul, like when, when you think about this year and what you were able to accomplish in a world where people aren't traveling, and um, is, is the way of doing business for you guys like fundamentally different in, in some respects? Like, uh, should we think of SDNA as you know, a percentage of sales structurally lower, even as things do start to come back? Going forward, um, I mean, yes and no. I think you know, I've been in finance for a while, and every year we would try to, you know, squeeze T and E to drive some some profitability. And it turns out a global pandemic is actually a more effective technique in reducing travel and entertainment than finance people berating people come forecast or budget time. But you know, so we've been fairly conservative about our planning for for T and E for this year. Although, you know, to be clear, we would like to be traveling more. We would like to be visiting you know, customers more, you know, we've pivoted nicely to online sales activities, but, you know, we really do value that face-to-face -face relationship with our customers and, and, and clearly with other cognoids too. So, you know, it's a part of the, I expect that will ramp up fairly slowly. Um, we, we're going to get some savings on that in Q1 because we're anniversarying, you know, largely a pre-COVID world in Q1, but I, I would hope that in the back half of the year, you know, we'll see a little more. I think the nature of our activities we do will be different. I think kind of when we choose to meet will maybe be different than we've done before. Uh, you know, one example of that being sales launches, uh, sales product launches. You know, we launched our largest product, uh, the D900, entirely virtually this year, and, and actually there was some real benefits to, to doing that, um, and that you don't have a whole bunch of people with non-refundable tickets from around the world depending on a certain product launch timing, and if we decide actually we want to hold that product for one more month, you know, we're not, you know, we're not left kind of holding the bag or, or, or making kind of difficult decisions. So 
uh, you know, and, and then, you know, to some extent, we obviously would look at real estate, you know, going forward. Although, again, I think Cognex will be a place where we always value the face-to-face collaboration, particularly for our engineers, our solution providers. Um, but, you know, on the margin, we, we did close, you know, 11 offices through the course of our restructuring or, or downsize and, um, you know, obviously look at our real estate portfolio as well. Thanks, guys. Our next question comes from the line of Matt Somerville with DA Davidson. You may proceed with your question. Thanks, and congrats to Dr. Bob as well. Um, just a uh, one question here. When you think about kind of the sequential revenue cadence as we move throughout the year, should we be thinking about seasonality differently this year? You have a front end maybe loaded logistics year versus kind of easy one Q comps in China, easy second quarter comps in other parts of the world due to the lockdown. Uh, and then you have kind of the moving pieces with CE. And I know it's hard to, to sort of guide out beyond one quarter, but maybe Rob, if you're able to give us some sense for how we should be thinking uh, about that sequential cadence, that might be helpful. Yeah. Hi, hi Matt. Um, you know, in, in general, Cognix, we don't give, you know, annual, annual guidance, um, but, but I think here's what we, we have said or, you know, can say is that we're expecting a large, unusually large first quarter as a result of um, logistics uh, backlog turning into revenue. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a you know, very healthy logistics business that, you know, is putting up great, great growth numbers. So, you know, I do expect good growth continuing through the year, but not to the degree that we've seen this, what will be an unusual Q1 for Cognex. Um, and then, you know, consumer electronics, um, it's, it's, it's been, um, you know, a pretty reliable, large contributor to growth in Q2 or 3. You know, that's, um, or both, right? That's gone on for many years now, and I would expect, you know, to see similar things. And we'll have more of a sense of the timing of that when we talk to you in the, at the next conference call in, in early May. Um, and then Q4 is always, a, you know, a strong quarter for our broad factory automation business. You know, it tends to be a lot of uh, year-end purchasing from markets like automotive and, and other um, other general markets, food, beverage, pharmaceuticals, medical. So as often, particularly in, in the U.S., where there's kind of a budget flush phenomenon that goes on. So I'm not able to give you, um, you know, uh, specific, but I, I think that's the kind of cadence I, I would expect. And I think Q1, obviously, is going to be unusually large due to this very large um, logistics revenue that's going to hit us. Thank you. And then maybe as a follow-up, can you maybe comment as to the actionability of what you may have in the M&A pipeline and how we should be thinking about share repurchases? You guys were pretty active in Q1 and then kind of tabled things for the balance of 2020. Thank you. I'll talk about M&A type stuff, and then I'll have Paul um, talk about perhaps, uh, you know, the uh, other balance sheet issues. So, you know, at, at, at Cognix, we're always looking at um, uh, acquisition opportunities, you know, and, um, you know, we really like to purchase um, technology companies with uh, great engineers and technology who can, uh, you know, bring it to Cognix. And you've seen us do that with Sua Lab and Vidi and NShape and Kiaro and other businesses that we've acquired over the last five years or so. Um, so we're always working on that, um, and, uh, you know, those deals happen you know, when, when they happen and when they're actionable. So there's nothing specifically I can point to. Um, and uh, so that, that's, that's, um, that's kind of how the outlook is there, um, you know, and, uh, um, but Paul can speak to other aspects of the balance sheet. Yep. No, thanks. And, you know, Matt, I think, for, as we've said before, the, the purpose of our stock buyback program is primarily to offset the dilution from stock-based compensation. So, you know, we repurchased, as you noted, 1.2 million shares in, in Q1 of 2020, um, spent $51 million doing so, an average price of $42, which looks really good right now from a repurchase point of view. Um, and that, but that actually did cover the dilution from our 2020 annual grant, you know, during that first quarter. Um, we, don't, we don't take the, the, the buyback so time constrained as it maybe looked last year. We do tend to issue our, the majority of our equity in, you know, in the first quarter as we, you know, do through annual, you know, grant programs. But our kind of mandate from the board to buy back that dilution is really quite broad. You know, we, we, we would aspire to do it, you know, in year broadly, but timing within year or if it happened to carry over, you know, to some extent or we happen to be opportunistic and buy a little more, you know, I would view all of that as sort of consistent with our, 
with our philosophy. So, you know, we we do have $280 million roughly remaining in our repurchase program. Um, so I feel like we've got, you know, we've got cash and dry powder. Um, we will be issuing, you know, equity, you know, quite shortly. And, uh, you know, we'll we'll make those decisions in, in partnership with the board kind of quarter to quarter about, you know, when to be more aggressive and, and, and when to get ahead of dilution and, you know, use 10B51 trading plans as appropriate as well. Great. Thank you, guys. Our next question comes from the line of Karen Lau with Gordon Haskett. You may proceed with your question. Um, hi, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, my congrats to Dr. Bob on his retirement as well. Um, so, um, Rob, I think uh, two quarters ago you initiated the, um, you know, the cost reduction action, I guess, with the premise that your $1 billion sales milestone has been pushed out because of the pandemic, right? Um, if you keep going at that rate, you wouldn't have to re- wait very long to reach that milestone. So I guess the question is, at what point um, do you think uh, you have to add back, you know, kind of people costs? And obviously, you, you saw very strong incremental margins for fourth quarter and in your 1Q guide. So um, I'm just curious, you know, at what point does cost have to come back? And is there something about perhaps the new way of selling or new ways of operating that might lend itself for salespeople to be much more productive than previous cycles, so you may not have to add back so quickly. Yeah, hi, Karen. Um, so I think uh, I, I think if you go back and you look at, you know, Cognix's uh, headcount increases and in our investments over the last three years, well, perhaps, you know, since 2017, you can, you, you can see that our level of investment and our headcount additions have exceeded our revenue growth significantly. And I think coming into um, this the, into 2020, um, you know, we're expecting strong growth, and uh, and then when COVID hit, we realized that that was going to be pushed out. So it became obvious that we needed to kind of adjust our um, our headcount. Um, but we also saw opportunities to shift headcount in, into areas where we saw stronger growth going forward. So logistics and deep learning being obvious examples. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, and then you know, I I, I think. It's been just a very volatile situation. So I think we've, re, you know, we restructured the company in a in a, in a very you know, healthy way for its future growth, and uh, and I think we still have good capacity in the business to absorb more growth without adding a lot of significant headcount. Um, but but we'll have to see kind of how things develop going forward and where what rates of growth and what need for headcount we have. Um, in future, I would point to our you know our engineering spend, which is a percentage of. Uh, Revenue was certainly relatively high and healthy. We spent more last year on uh, on R and D than we spent in any year in the company's history. So certainly, you know, we're not. Um, we certainly haven't um, uh, curtailed our R and D and our engineering our product launch plans in any way. So in terms of where we may need capacity, it may be more in the sales force. Um, but if you look mm-hmm. at our numbers overall, it doesn't imply that we're you know, we're, um, we're understaffed or capacity constrained in most areas of the business, at least in the short term. Okay. Um, so, so the incremental margins for now is, you know, should be pretty sustainable. And then, you know, uh, and then, you know, you kind of re-eval- have to reevaluate in the, towards the middle of the year and see, you know, how the recovery trajectory is going and if you have to add, need, uh, uh, add additional salespeople as part of the um, process, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I think we're watching the situation very carefully. You said margin. I mean, the only, and I think as that relates to expense, that's probably correct. I think you know we did point out that um, we expect our gross margins to be a little lower um, in uh, Q1 as a result of more logistics business, which generally is its margins are improving nicely over time, but it still is dilutive to our gross margin. So that would be the only qualification I'd put on what you said. Yeah, and, and Rob, I could add, you know, on the operating expense point of view, you know, a year ago we were calling out, you know, roughly $25 million of kind of incremental OPEX going into our cost base in 2020 associated with, you know, a reset of our annual compensation plans, having not paid a bonus in 2019, and then, you know, a full year of SUA lab expenses, a portion of which is, you know, deep learning engineers and the team and the salespeople there, as well as and a portion of which is just the structure of the acquisition, which has a deterred compensation component that hits your OPEX over a, over a four-year period. You know, we don't see sort of any major disc, you know, ads like that in, in the current year. I think there are some puts and takes, right? 
this quarter will be a little low on T&E. I hope in the back half will be a little higher. You know, for the year we've, we've, we expect our T&E to be up slightly. Um, you know, from a headcount, we're making an, a, a major investment, which we cited in our 10K, around a new CRM and CPQ, configure price quote and customer relationship management system. Uh, I think we've, we've referenced up to about $10 million in spend, much of that CapEx this year, but some of that OpEx. Um, you know that we're that we're bringing. So we have some puts and takes, but by and large, I don't think there's any sort of major resets. Let's say like there was from 2019 going into 2020. Um, and then of course we have two more quarters of you know Q1 and Q2 where we should be seeing, you know, seeing a healthy benefit from the restructuring actions we took last May. Got it. Got it. That, that's very helpful, color. Thank you. Um, and then I, I want to follow up on um, the the um, auto discussion. So, Rob, you talked about like the differences, um, you know, uh, the different exposure in you know EV different components versus uh, you know uh, IC exposure. Um, so, actually, you have a very strong uh, relationship with the tier one um, um, suppliers in the auto supply chain. How is your competitive positioning um, on the EV component side? And are you seeing sort of a, you know, different competitive dynamics coming across different, you know, competitors, things like that? If you can give us a little bit of color on, like, how you're positioning you know, EV versus your um, historical um, uh, exposures. Yeah, Karen, I think I think that one thing I'd point to is I think, uh, you know, a lot of those, the tier one, um, uh, you know, suppliers that Cognexus has very strong and has been the majority of our automotive business. You know, obviously, we continue to work very closely with them. Um, but I think some of the, um, the uh, you know, the kind of powertrain, internal combustion type of parts of their business obviously is declining and being replaced with EV battery business. And a lot of the technology that goes into making, you know, EV batteries has been really developed and is being um, scaled up um, by Asian companies. Right, so uh, so that's been kind of a shift. Um, where and, and the problems they're working on, in some ways, are in some in some ways very different. But fortunately, there are areas that Cognex technology and a very capable and, uh, and and substantial sales force in Asia is very well equipped to deal with. So this is an area where you know we've been able to pivot our business in, in some ways, and it's more like electronics. Um, we've been working with those very sophisticated EV battery manufacturers, notably in Korea and in China, um, to, uh, to, to meet their needs using some technology and capability that we perhaps had originally thought we would use in electronics. So, so overall, I think we're pretty well positioned. Um, you see some of those, those names that are big EV suppliers, you know, and, and also EV car manufacturers themselves who are making plays in batteries, you know, are starting to be much more substantial customers with Cognex probably at the expense of some of the tier one suppliers, notably in, in Europe, who, you know, maybe over the long run are losing share um, to that shift that's going on in business. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Andrew Biscaglia. With Baron Skirt, you may proceed with your question. Congrats, uh, Dr. Bob, and good luck. Um, Thanks, Andrew. Actually, I had a really important question for you, though, uh, before you go. I'm surprised no one's asked it yet. But, so, you know, what does your departure mean for those really entertaining annual reports that you guys put out? <laughs> well, I think you're going to like the one for 2020, and uh, I was certainly involved in that one. And, and as an advisor, I'm going to continue to be a cognoid. I don't know if the press release made that clear, and advisor to the board and the company. And I expect that uh, they will still call on me for uh, – from my input, my creative uh, input into future annual reports. I, but, uh, I hope that there's no change in our philosophy of uh, taking our work seriously but not taking ourselves seriously. <laughs> That's great to hear. Uh, so now for uh, a couple other questions I have. Um, you know, um, Robert, you cited um, some interesting commentary on, on AI and deep learning. Uh, in the quarter, you know, it's starting, it's, it's starting to perk up in your sales. Can you give us some sort of context around how you think about that in 2021? Is this still, is this going to be, you know, it's growing fast, so is this going to be, um, you know, come, popping up as meaningful um, to our revenue or, or margins or both? You know, and then what end markets should we expect to see some, you know, additional movement from AI deep learning? 
Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Andrew. And I, I just got to add that, you know, there's no, no one more creative to tap than Dr. Bob for the annual report. So I think he's, uh, with, he's going to be one of his key advising roles. Good to hear. Uh, to help Good. us with, with, with that. Um, but, um, yeah, so, so about deep learning, uh, I'll make some commentary on that. You know, it's, um, we, we, you know, we see it as um, technology that's kind of uh, you know, changing the vision space. And it's an area we're investing in and leading in a lot. You know, it, it's primarily software-driven. The gross margins are very good and highly accretive to our business. We said it more than doubled last year. It's still less than 10% of our business overall, but um, it is a big growth driver. It's happening really on two fronts. One is we're taking that technology and putting it into the smart camera insight platform that we have and the D900 um, uh, that we launched, you know, one of our most successful product launches at if not the most successful product launch we've ever had, you know, is um, is using that technology and making it easily available. And so you can expect more of that to go on and, I think, change the uh, modular vision system, um, uh, a smart camera type space that we serve. And then also it's really providing a lot to um, the very, you know, high performance, high processor requirement business that is our vision software business. And, uh, you know, that's bringing a lot of technology, particularly into the electronic space now. And um, it, it's adding a lot of value, particularly around the inspection area. Some of the technology we acquired from Sewer Lab is highly relevant in this space and is beginning to get traction with customers. Some of its introduction was held back a little bit by not being able to get engineers on site to customers during the COVID situation. But, you know, we're seeing, I think, hopefully an end to that. Um, and, uh, and, and the real opportunity there is to replace human inspectors, you know, and there are tens of not hundreds, many hundreds of thousands who are working on visually inspecting products that we think are technology um, in that space using vision software. And some of the, you know, our large customers who are very technically sophisticated see this potential and are working on it with us. So, you know, I think there are two avenues that we see deep learning changing, and, you know, we're expecting to continue to see really solid growth as the great engineering capability we have in that space leads more and more into our product line over the years. Interesting. Okay. And, um, you know, everything's pretty picked over, but are you, are you able to give us um, a sense of the percentage of sales from each M market? Because I, I did hear you say automotive is a third, I believe. Or do you, are you guys willing to break that out, the first two? I think I think what we said, and Paul can come in here too, I think we said uh, electronics was approximately 30% of our business overall. I think we said, um, I think we said uh, automotive. Did, did we mention that, Paul? Yes. Yeah. So uh, logistics was second for 2020 at about 20%. Automotive was also about 20%, yeah. but, but lower than, slightly lower than logistics. And then... You know, kind of the remainder of our portfolio, which would include consumer products, food and beverage, medical, you know, semiconductors, would, would comprise the remaining 30%. Okay. okay. Not, not, Great. Not, Thanks, guys. Not that you need a reason to, to read our very exciting annual report, which is coming up, but I think there's a little, there are a few pie charts in there that break it down as well. I think okay, great. Enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to it. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Blake Gendrum with Wolf Research. You may proceed with your question. Yeah, thanks. Good evening. Thanks for speaking me on here. And, and Dr. Bob, probably a short list of uh, company founders that, that retire at least to a degree with company strength at an all-time high, so congrats. Um, you know, I, thanks, Blake. You, you've, talked about, you've talked about consumer tech. You've talked about uh, the qualitative outlook there and, and, you know, maybe the puts and takes and, and – on the periphery of this question, but I'm just wondering in terms of uh, semi shortages and, and what we're seeing in terms of bottlenecks in the supply chain, how that impacts either the, the throughput and, and more the demand side on consumer tech, uh, or you know if it, if it impacts your your input costs to any meaningful degree. Yes, hi. Well, I think we, we spoke a little bit to that question earlier. It, you know, is it related? We we don't see um, shortages in our own supply chain. Where you know we're seeing our automotive customers struggle with it, um, but it doesn't. You know, we're unclear whether that means they're pulling forward. Um, in consumer electronics, it's not clear to me at the moment that you know that's having any impact. But as we as we know, that business scales later in the year. So we're really going to have a better answer to that question, I think, um, when we report next next time. 
Okay, that makes sense. Um, and then just to dig into 3D here a little bit, it sounds like it's an exciting growth avenue for uh, yourselves on the broader market here in machine vision. I'm just wondering, you know, specifically in manufacturing, as 3D applications grow, is there any crosstalk or cross communication with 2D vision? Is there any, you know, cannibalization, I guess, of one versus the other as, as 3D gets a bit more popular here? How should we how should we think about um, the interplay between 3D and maybe other major uh, buckets of machine vision? Yeah, I would say, you know, if you, you probably wouldn't do things in 3D that you could do in 2D because it's easier and less expensive, less processor required, less optics required, right? So, you know, 3D, I think, is additive, um, you know, um, and, uh, we, you know, we're going to see lots of 3D and 2D uh, together, right, in applications, and we certainly have those capabilities and more and more of our customers are using them. So perhaps the way to think about it is it's going to grow the market, um, and it's going to lead to, you know, higher spend per customer to do more and more sophisticated things with their application. Makes sense. Thanks for the time. Thanks. And I, I think we're near the top of the hour. So um, I think we'll, we'll uh, Dr. Bob, I think we'll, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. And I want to thank uh, all of Cognix's stakeholders, our customers, our employees, our vendors, our neighbors, and our shareholders for helping us to grow and succeed over the past 40 years. I want to thank our customers for partnering with us through tough times. I want to thank our Cognoids around the world, both past and present, for their dedication to our mission. I want to thank our vendors for delivering high-quality components to us at fair prices and on time, even during part shortages. And I want to thank our neighbors where Cognix has offices for providing us with safe and attractive neighborhoods in which we can work and play. And last but not least, I want to thank our shareholders who took the time to understand our company and its unique work hard, play hard, move fast culture and who have maintained their trust in us through these years. Thank you again for joining us tonight, and here's to another 40 fantastic years during which Cognix will continue to preserve and enhance vision. Good night. This concludes today's conference. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.